First of all, thank you very much for having me here today, Gary and Norma, wherever you are. <laughs> Just here. Um, I'm, I felt a bit intimidated coming here because, as you might have gathered, I'm an art historian and not a mosaic maker. And nonetheless, I will be talking a lot about the techniques that were used in creating mosaics for the VNA in its early days. Um, and that always feels a bit daunting if you have people around you who know everything about making mosaics, but I'm more specialized in actually studying the history and so on. But anyway, I think it's quite important to give you a bit of a background of how much mosaics mattered to the Victoria and Albert Museum in its early days um, and how much of them you can still see around. So as we go through my uh, presentation, I will sort of give you um, the gallery numbers wherever works are on display. Since it is a very big museum, I suppose that some of you might find it difficult to tell from the gallery number where they are. Come and find me afterwards and I can tell you if you're looking for one particular mosaic. What I'm going to do is give you a brief overview of the status. Um, and as you might know, the museum was established in um, 1857, um, coming out of the Great Exhibition, and as a place of inspiration, enjoyment, and not to be forgotten, also education. And that's still very much um, present to the present day. And that meant when the decision was taken to create a permanent building for the museum, um, that became a training ground for all sorts of media, of all sorts of arts, including mosaics. And in terms of mosaics, it's particularly the period 1860 to roughly 1870 that is like the most creative and innovative time of experimenting with mosaics in various materials. And um, this um, slide, this um, print actually comes from the 1868 Museum Guide, which was one of the first guides ever to be made. And it shows you the tympanum that has just been finished with the wonderful mosaics. And it's slightly, um, I think there's, unfortunately, some of the labels have slightly disappeared. But it has, it has just been finished in a mosaic technique, showing you bits of the um, great exhibition. In the middle, have you have Queen Victoria handing out the prizes. And that was the main facade of the museum until the early 20th century. So mosaics were right. As you approached the museum, you had mosaics in front of you on a monumental scale. So the Tate Modern doesn't have that. Um, <laughs> but we do. <laughs> and we're proud of it. Um, we're proud to have you here. So generally spoken, in those early days, there were three ways how mosaics could become part of the museum's collection. Historic mosaics were purchased, and also reproductions of those as source of inspiration and learning. Professional mosaicists were commissioned to contribute works to the fabric of the building, as we have it here, and most importantly, a all-female class for mosaics was established at the art school attached to the museum. And that was meant for women to learn to assemble mosaics rather than actually to learn to design them as well. So it's only one part of the process from our perspective, whereas the design and the instruction were done exclusively by men. As it was stood on. And it was considered, and that's um, something going back to the mid 19th century, that mosaics was one of the techniques that could be considered an exercise of virtue, something to better you, better you, you as, a, as a person, as a human being. And that's something that you find very much at the South Kensington School all female or ladies mosaics class, as it is called, and which is established, established in 1862. Um, I'm going to focus on the creation of mosaics because uh, I think that's the most relevant aspect for you rather than talking you through the historic collection of mosaics at the VNA. But we can do a bit of that tomorrow as we, when we go into the Gilbert Galleries. Um, so come along if you want to. Just to give you an idea of what type of work um, and what scale of the work you find at the VNA. This is one of the stairs next to the exhibition area. So when you head towards um, Hollywood costumes, you will see that. Um, heading on a bit further and ignoring Indiana Jones, I can point you in the direction. That's also from the early period of mosaics. The question of mosaics was an ongoing experiment with many achievements, and I will look at those in a couple of minutes. There are also slightly less successful attempts of innovation, and one of them is what you can see here on the ceramic staircase, which is ob obviously all dedicated to ceramics. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see uh, something which is not really a mosaic, but also very relevant for the story we, we are looking at here. Um, it's a technique called fictile vitrification, which was um, invented by Colin Minton Kemper, who also invented special mosaic um, ceramic tesserae 
for the use at a museum. It's unique in the sense that it tries to be a bit of both. So let's have a slightly closer look. So what you have are actually hexagonal ceramic tesserae, which are tried and then painted on, then put together, cemented together, put into the kiln and fired. Um, and the idea was that this would allow painters to create eternal pictures directly without the, the need of a craftsman to translate their design into a durable picture. And it was um, supposed that this would be the most suitable technique to withstand the damp English climate. And in a way, the, a suitable alternative for mosaics and fresco painting for the English eyes as opposed to the Italian versions where, where they thought the climate would be nicer and more suitable for those two <coughs> techniques. Um, but I think that if we look at the pictures from our perspective now, and it has to be said that I think there was some restoration work done to these pictures which was not entirely in line with the original intentions, it doesn't really work. It is a bit of technique that's stuck between the two. You see straight away it's um, put together from tesserae, but nonetheless it's denying this very nature by trying to be a painting. So that's one of those aspects of innovation that went on at the young VNA, which then were a bit of a dead end. And they had big hopes, but uh, you will not be surprised to hear that essentially it wasn't a commercial success. And I, I don't know of any other example than um, the ceramic staircase in the VNA um, that has this kind of work to it. And there's also this one big que um, question that isn't answered anywhere in the reports on it. It's like, how big can you actually get with that? Because you need a kiln big enough to fit it in. And that's where it already stops and all the comparison with mosaics or fresco painting is completely, yeah, let ad absurdum. So that was one of the dead ends, but on the same staircase, face to face with this weird and wonderful Fichtal vitrification, it's one of the um, better known mosaics from the VNA, um, the memorial to Sir Henry Cole. Um, and you probably all have heard of Sir Henry Cole. He's the figurehead of the, the creation of the museum and also the great exhibitor, as some of his biographers called him. He masterminded the great exhibition and then subsequently became the first director of the museum. And he led the construction of the permanent building on this site. And throughout his tenure, he was probably the most avid promoter of mosaics as a future art form, as a future distinct English art form, if only the right material and distinctly English material could be identified and used. And he also was a big supporter of the female class at the VNA. After his retirement, this um, memorial was created in mosaics, it needs to be said. Um, after a long discussion which material would be the right one, it was decided that it's mosaics they had to go for. And I think that says a lot about the status of the technique. It has to be said that this work marks the end of an era of mosaic making at the museum. It also shows the end product of a decade of experimentation at the ladies' mosaic class. Um, Coe's mosaic portrait and the story of its creation stand indeed for everything that was attempted in, with commissions of mosaics from the art school in the best sense, because you can see it's a very beautiful piece, but also in terms of failed experiments, and that will become clear as we will go through my slides. It was completed in 1877, and as such is arguably the latest mosaic of that type at the VNA, and we will get back to it. In the 19th century, by and large, Great Britain was not a country particularly known as a place for mosaic production, and of course that has all changed. Um, this does not mean that mosaics were not purchased in Great Britain. They were. But more often than not, these mosaics were made in Italy. Um, and it was indeed an Italian company that was commissioned for a large percentage of the mosaics for the permanent building of the museum. And it's none other than Salviati in Murano, which was, funnily enough, founded by a lawyer, Dr. Antonio Salvati, and at that time partly owned by an Englishman. So, there is an English connection even in Italian mosaics. And I just thought I'd show you those um, samples of um, reproduction of mosaics in various Venetian places that Salviati supplied for the, um, let's say, study collection of the museum in 1870, so slightly later on. Um, but the most important contribution, it could be argued, of Salviati is to the so-called Kensington Valhalla, um, the name Kensington Valhalla for a large cycle, and I will show you some details here, goes back to um, 
it's not one that the, the South Kensington Museum came up with itself. It was actually a rather, it was meant as an insult more than anything else um, in a review of a cycle of these monumental portraits of artists of all times in mosaics that were created for one of the exhibition places. And this, and um, South Kensington Valhalla was meant to say that, that there's a lot of aspiration, but they don't really deliver. And one of the reasons why it was considered that it didn't really deliver, and here you can see the space in a slightly unfinished um, state, was that the designs and cartoons for these mosaics were in fact not really um, that varied. So in a way, if you looked at them next to each other, it became a slightly boring experience, it was felt at the time. Whereas in, in true, in, in on what the, the original plan was behind it was to echo um, a sacred space, to have, you know, I'm thinking of um, that court and that um, space as a sort of a chapel to design and art and its saints um, in all these artists. Um, and that clearly was already not, was not understand at the time. The mosaics remained in place until after the Second World War, but um, are currently only, well, most of them, it's 35 in total, most of them are currently in storage, some in a better state than others. Um, but some of them are on display, again, opposite the exhibition space. So again, if you head for Hollywood costumes, you will not fail um, and find them and see them. And the first mosaics for this group were made using well-established materials like Giorgione, whom we've got, uh, just saw, um, and other English glass mosaics by Harland and Fisher, for example, and Salviati and co. contributed a lot. Um, but the mosaics that are most interesting or most innovative in this group are the ceramic mosaics contributed by the class um, at the art school, where the lady students used ceramic material invented by Colin Minton Campbell, who was also behind the fictile vitrification. So that was a slightly more successful um, yeah, enterprise. And I suppose at the heart of it is a very similar material. It's just used in a slightly different ways. Um, the documents repeatedly and very proudly actually refer to this type of mosaic as English ceramic mosaic. So that it's the idea of finding the national type of mosaic. And this is what they identified as the result, as the outcome. And one such mosaic is, in fact, Titian here, um, one of the most celebrated painters of Venice, who's actually known to have contributed or provided cartoons for some of the most celebrated Venetian mosaic artists, including Zuccati. Um, and I find it kind of funny, if I've got a couple of details here for you, and wonder what Titian would, would have to say to the fact that he was, his mosaic is assembled in English ceramics by English mosaicists, even so he was always a big supporter of Venetian mosaics, but maybe that he wouldn't have, he would have liked that very much, I could imagine. Um, The portrait goes back to George Frederick Watts. Some of the people who contributed cartoons for the series of the um, Kensington Valhalla were very well known, Leighton, for example. Others were just out of art school. So it's, again, this, funny, this interesting mix that you also find in the mosaics, that you have well-established professionals from abroad and from within the country, Salviati, Paul, etc. And then you mix it with something completely new. People are just starting out, um, women even, which in a way was also... Um, very exotic, and, and that's what actually is the important thing about the Kensington Valhalla, regardless to what you think of the aesthetics behind it. Um, the mosaics by the, were made by the lady students using an indirect technique, which allowed actually several students to work on the same piece together. I've got a very detailed description with me, should you be interested, so come and find me afterwards. And it, what I find hard to establish, looking at the documents, is how long, how long they actually took to create each and every panel, because what we don't have anymore in our archives is the details on how these classes were run. How often did they meet? How many ladies worked on a mosaic? We assume it's two, but we don't really know. How long did they meet? It's the, the only thing you can sort of figure out is that they deliver about one monumental panel per year. But did they meet every week? Did they meet for one hour or two hours? We just don't have these documents anymore. But what becomes clear from that is it wasn't reported to the board, so in a way it didn't matter. And I think that in itself is something to, to keep in mind. Um, you still remember this weird and wonderful fictile vitrification. And it's quite interesting also to think about that here, because 
Um, Coleman and Kemper, of course, made sure that both techniques, both these innovative types of tessera, were adequately promoted. And for that purpose, he asked um, Ellen Cole, who's not related to the best of my knowledge, to Henry Cole, to present the techniques at, with a paper at the Society of Arts in 1870. Um, of course, he makes all the right noises and explains why both techniques are wonderful. Um, but he also comes up with something that's a very bold demand with what can only be described, I think, as this super confidence that's sort of very typical for Victorian times. And it's so outrageous, I think, even from our point of view, that I think I just have to share it with you. And so he explained in 1870 to the Society of Arts a somewhat new process as known used by Messrs. Hinton, Minton and Hollins um, to this kind of mosaics. I propose to give the name Opus Anglicanum. So here we are. We don't only have a national mosaic, we have a Latin name for it. But there is a problem because he continues, I believe this term has been applied to certain English needlework. Hmm. I think it is more appropriately applied to mosaic work rather than needlework so that I can trust some other name may be given to needlework as a confusion of names is always to be regretted. And I now get on to Mr. Kemper's process, which I suggest should be named Opus Fictile Pictorum and considered a subsection of Opus Anglicarum. So it's all very complicated, but it's this typical recurring thing. You need a label, you need a name, and it needs to be Latin. And I'm not quite sure if you have heard of Opus Anglicarum before. I hadn't. So I did what every self-respecting curator does in the 21st century. I Googled it. And <laughs> ended up on the V&A's homepage, <laughs> and this is what, what we got. Uh, it actually turns out that Opus Anglicanum is a term for a kind of luxury product from the 13th to the 14th century, and the term is already used in the 13th century and used to the present day, and it's just a staple. Opus Anglicanum is the very best in English needlework, um, and you might not be surprised again to, re to find that it still is used for needlework and um, the 1870 campaign to establish Opus Anglicanum as the official name for English, or whatever you want to call them, at least ceramic mosaics, has not been entirely successful. <laughs> um, should you be interested in see the competition, this one is in Gallery 10, and it's a very, very fine piece, so I thought I'd just include it as a little sidekick. The question is, what will I be left now? Maybe we need a new title for this very specific um, ceramics mosaic, time um, Minton mosaics done at the V&A uh, class for Lady Mosaicis. I'm not quite sure, maybe it's something like Opus Kensington or Opus Minton, <laughs> if, if, if a need exists to have a Latin name for it. Um, but let's just forget about the terminology for a moment and have a closer look at one of the Salviati mosaics on the left-hand side in comparison to one of the homemade South Kensington works. Um, as you can see, golden tessera are always a slightly difficult one to achieve and a challenge in, in any material. Um, the portrait of William Wycombe on the left-hand side was completed in 1867 and was bought by the museum for 300 pounds together with Giorgione, so um, actually quite good price in comparison to some of the other works they bought from other companies. Mm -hmm. Christopher Wren on the other side, and I'm just showing you details because these are fiendishly difficult to photograph and I didn't want you to leave with only a tiny plot visible around sort of, um, um, yeah, just reflection. So um, that's um, details of that. So Christopher Wren is an Opus Anglicanum, or English mosaic, um, completed in 1869 by the ladies class. Um, and as you can see, it's just quite obvious that it's A, it's the golden color that doesn't quite match up, but it's also just the range of colors and the reflection, and especially in the face, it becomes quite obvious there's still a long way to go um, to bring the ceramics mosa uh, ceramic mosaics up to the same level as the glass mosaics. But on the other hand, you have to say it was very early days for these techniques, whereas the Venetians have been yeah, working in, in that technique for almost millennia and had lots of time to um, reach a level of perfection. And it's a bit of a tough competition to ask these people to go through. Um, so in a way, that's, it's important to keep in mind that there are these differences in quality, but it's also important to keep in mind they come from different starting points and had a different time span to develop it. There's another aspect of work of mosaics in the V&A that I'd like to share with you, and again, it involves women, and it again 
involves something that could be um, considered at the time as a very um, innovative social project. Um, some of the mosaics floor were laid by female convicts of Woking Prison. And I'm showing you two pictures here which were actually taken in the 20th century, but which I think make it very clear what a bleak and Dickensian space or place to be it was. Actually, this building in the background here is, to be, is supposed to be the women's prison. So it was a tiny part of the large prison. In 1869, a corporation was decided to um, involve women in creating mosaic tiles with refused marble for a certain area in, in the museum. It, it was supposed to be the starting point for a much larger cooperation. And the approval it took half a year to come through. They weren't entirely convinced that this was a good idea to do. <laughs> um, and Opus Criminal is actually a title used by Ellen Cole, the guy who also invented Opus Americanum. I figured out only last week when looking at the documents. So he, he obviously needed a Latin name for everything, but Opus Criminale is still the, the term. If you ask anybody at the VNA, they will, they will have heard of it um, if they've been here for a couple of months. But it was um, a bit under debate in 1869. Um, again, it was created in an indirect technique, which allowed to create um, the tires in prison, and then they were brought on site and laid out as floors. So that's why you can see those divisions between the little tires. Um, Dukan, who was behind the corporation and um, sort of negotiated it with Henry Cole, had to give a report to the VNA board in 1871. And he includes some notes not only on the process, but also on how much work could be done per day, which is very interesting because we never find these notes on the ladies' mosaics class, but the female prisoners are under more pressure to deliver. So I'm not quite sure how that measures up to what you do in your work. And you know, quantity is not the only category that matters, of course, but for what, for what it's worth, here's what he wrote. It is found that after a little instruction, a woman can perform each of these stages of manufactures at the following rate. Setting, 99 feet, 0 0.99 feet per diem, big difference. Cementing, 9.44 feet per diem, and facing, 1.8 feet per diem. Um, the preparation of patterns, he goes on, is of course the work of a foreman or instructor and designs may be furnished by an artist. So the women are purely working on laying out these mosaics without any further instruction and pro my, most likely without any chance to ever see the finished product. So how far that actually helped to better them is another question if you only see a tiny bit of that. Um, but it's an interesting approach and so that's one picture of what it looks like at the moment. That's a more detailed picture and you can see that there, are, there is, again, a variation and difference of quality from tile to tile sometimes, where you can almost see that there must have been different um, prisoners working on that. What strikes me most, and that brings me back to um, Titian again, when looking at the experiments going on at the young VNA, especially in relation to mosaics, is that there seems to have been surprisingly little fear of failure in this particular decade, 1860 to roughly 1870. Deadlines and perfection were goals, much more for the working convicts who had to deliver X feet per diem. The mosaics class seems to have been, to some extent, oblivious to such demands. They appear to have been blissfully experimenting on what is actually a surprisingly large scale, and with results that essentially at that stage naturally could not compete with work in other materials and by professional mosaic artists. Nonetheless, so Henry Cole's memorial was made in, in mosaics, in that very English technique. Um, but it also becomes clear, and that brings me back to the mosaic we talked about earlier, that this blissful state of experimentation where they just try out what goes, let's involve the prisoners, let's involve the mosaics class, that this couldn't last forever. And um, it did not survive the pressure of commercial competition. The mosaics class was closed in 1872. 10 years after it was first established. And Frank Moody had to report to the board on the closure of the class. And here's what he says. The ladies' mosaics class has recently been closed for want of work, which is much to be regretted, for I have again to report during the past year considerable progress in this difficult art. So he makes it clear, it's, you're asking a lot, and we're actually getting somewhere. 
And he goes on, if the faces are in some instances wanting precision and force, there are parts of the traperies that can hardly be exceeded in force, roundness, and truth of tone. It's a very apologetic report. Um, but nonetheless, the class was closed. In the same report, he also had to give an update on other mosaic projects at the museum, including, and I'm showing you a ceramic mosaic of the same design, but we are talking about a project of a class mosaic pavement for the North Court, one of the central exhibition halls. Um, experiment for this project were carried out, carried out by <laughs> students of another class that was, and I quote, employed for works and must be considered in two aspects. First, as a class of instruction, and secondly, as a studio for practice in the work of decoration. And this is an all-male class. So the women are out. The idea of the genteel hobby of mosaics laying and experimenting is completely disappeared by that time. Um, there's the clear intention to train a workforce that can use the skills learned at, at the art school to actually make a living. And at that time, um, in Victorian England, that means that women were excluded. And with that, the idea of the exercise of virtue um, that Matthew Digby Wyatt had promoted in the mid-19th century comes to an end in a way. At least there were some words of praise for the Opus Criminale in this 1872 report. The marble mosaic executed by female convicts has been laid in the central corridor, corridor in, solidi sorry, in solidity and gravity of effect it's admirable, so that's, 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 at least that's something, it's better than nothing, but nonetheless, it seems that also this cooperation came to an end in that year. And that's, that's somewhat strange, that you have this kind of, they're working towards it, and you get the feeling they're getting the first results, and then suddenly it stops. And that's something that's slightly difficult to get your head around, and I have to confess that I'm still not entirely sure what actually happens, but I've got a bit of a, theory, I could say. And it's, it's basically, the question is, why suddenly this end? And I think it might have to do with Sir Henry Cole, who was, yes, the mastermind of the South Kensington Museum, a mastermind behind introducing these techniques and searching for innovation. But on the other hand, he was really a, a very, very flamboyant character, not to everybody's taste. And in 1872, he, he declared his power starts to wane, and they managed to find reasons to force him more or less into retirement in 1873. And this monument and the entire struggle around it, and there's pages and pages of documents, do we, have, we've, do we want a monument for him at all? Why does it have to be mosaics? That is the very end of it. And it seems that because that was so much his brainchild and this idea, not only to involve them with this technique, but also to involve women in the creation of these masterpieces, is done away with and gives way to seeing it purely as something that has to be regarded as a commercial exercise of just decorating the building. And that's what then continues well into the 20th century. And it's a bit sad, and I think we should get the spirit back of um, innovation of mosaics at the VNA. So that's a bit my personal mission. And yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>